has to happen. The cannons are loaded. The cannons are... And we're going to tackle some concepts this morning that I'm sure a, a large portion of you can relate to. And what we're going to do is I'm going to kind of descend backwards into my experience growing up in a farmer's world, right? The contemporary world that we live in uh, is built by farmers. It's a farmer's mindset. Things are stationary. Everyone's got their little fucking homestead. The hunter's brain is really not wired to fit in to the way the modern world is constructed. And that's why we see a lot of motherfuckers with ADHD and kind of a tailspin and some of these other mental defects that you could call them because they just don't fucking fit in with the way the modern world is set up. And growing up, I knew from a very early age, very early on, I had a sensibility about me and I had a perception that I was not designed for the world that we live in whatsoever. I was not I was not molded to be cast in the system that was laid before me. School, for me, was the most torturous place you could have fucking dropped me off to. I would have rather have been fucking paradropped into the Amazonian fucking rainforest with no tools. It was absolute torture. Even just the aesthetic from a, I'm talking real early on, real early on, elementary school. You're in a fucking concrete compound. You know what I mean? You're basically sitting in a cinder block. And these schools, the aesthetics are so fucking disgusting. It's something out of brutalist dystopian architecture. And if you think this wasn't done intentionally, you're fucking crazy. You're fucking crazy. Everything from the desks, the fucking cheap plastic the fucking casing under the fucking fake plywood on the fucking desks. Just the whole fucking thing. You're just you're sitting in a fucking room under fluorescent light. It's, it was always just a fucking disgraceful place to be. I always felt absolute torture in my soul when I was forced to sit in the fucking classroom. And the first giveaway, the first giveaway that there was some fucking authoritative wizardry going on to basically essentially leech and reeve the soul out of young up and coming learners was the the first like real touch of grace that kind of gave away the jig and things were never the same for me after I saw that even as a young boy coming up think about the existential dread of having to raise your hand and ask a fucking stranger to go take a piss like things things at that level if you were sitting in a classroom when you were a young boy and that didn't rub you the wrong way then you were just built to be a cog in the fucking machine for sure like that was the first giveaway the existential dread of having to raise your hand and basically beg and plead to ask to leave the fucking classroom to take a piss like, what the fuck is that? That is an absolute fucking horror show. And if that didn't ignite something in you as a young boy, I don't know what to tell you, buddy. I don't know what to tell you. But for me, that was like the first proof, the first glimmer of proof that there was a sleight of hand going on. Like, they're, they're trying to essentially fucking extinguish sparks of genius from an early age. They're trying to get you to submit Every fucking force, every institution is, is, has joined allegiances and they are literally in lockstep, in unison, designed to basically fucking smash outliers, just fucking crush you in every which way possible through demoralization, through, through dehumanization. That is fucking dehumanizing. I don't give a fuck what anybody says. That is 100% dehumanizing. To make a fucking kid have to ask to take a piss. That's fucking wild. Like, there's no two, there's no ifs, ands, or buts about it. It's an absurd concept. And there's so many other little nuances to that. But, like, the, look at the fucking schoolyard. 
I mean, like I said, you're just in a barrier. You're in a fucking prison. You know what I mean? From the steel gates that lock you in. Some of you motherfuckers probably had barbed wire layering the outskirts of the fucking campus. The quad is just a hunk of fucking concrete. It's just a stucco fucking concrete structure that you're stuck in all fucking day long, which is con conductive to heat. Heat doesn't dissipate. It's fucking hot. It's muggy. There's no fucking fresh air. You're seated. You're in a fucking submissive, defensive position. When people are fucking scolding you or fucking trying to impart knowledge, the whole thing makes zero sense biologically. Biologically, you're just getting fucking hammered. You know what I mean? Like you're learning to be just a submissive, a submissive little fucking obedient employee. Like that's what the whole system is. So from a very early age, I had a massive conflict with this whole setup. It just never rubbed me the right way. I would gnash my teeth and thrash my fucking tail to do anything to get the fuck out of it. Now, what happens is, is when you go through a hellish experience in school, you're going to start to develop a lot of personality quirks to defend against that. Because if you have fire in your soul, and you would know by now, by like the age of like seven, eight, if you have that fire in your soul, you know that you're just going to constantly fucking resist. But the thing is, it's so difficult. It's so tough to see that there's another possibility out there. That's, that's the problem. It's like you're, you're, you're looking through a kaleidoscope and your world is so microscopic because you have your parents enforcing this. They're the ones dropping you off at school. They're the ones kind of reinforcing the system on you. And you're just very trapped because you have no power as a youngster. And that's the real, that's the real battleground because you just don't have any authority. You have no agency. You have no power. You have no control over anything. You're just a fucking cork bobbing on the ocean and you're pretty much going to have to do what people tell you to do. You know what I mean? That's why when parents tell you, enjoy being a kid, because when you get older, you're going to have responsibility. That's one of the greatest lies ever told. Being a kid is horrifying. You have zero fucking power. Who the fuck wants to be a kid forever? It's the fucking worst position to be in. You know what I mean? The older you get... At least you can sharpen your talons and you can fucking flash some fangs every now and then and sort of carve out some territory for yourself. You don't have that opportunity when you're a youngster. So that whole fucking Peter Pan thing of enjoy it while you're young because you're free. Nonsense. Nonsense. That's a fucking psyop. So, you know, we go, we, we move along, we go into high school and you're still sort of just stuck in this rigmarole. You feel like you've pissed away the first 15 years of your life learning bullshit. Learning bullshit skills that aren't going to do a goddamn thing for you. So it's like by the time you're 18 in America, you kind of get the realization that you've pissed away the first 18 years of your life. Like life really does not begin for an American man, which explains the lack of maturity and it explains why everybody's so far behind emotionally is because life really doesn't begin until you get out of school because you basically pissed away the first 18 years of your life with no agency. The, the hunter's brain is completely fucking squashed. If you want to seek opportunity, you really can't. So you're just basically shackled. You're shackled. You're in a fucking straitjacket for the first 18 years and you just got to brave it and you got to cope with it and you got to survive it. And it's brutal. It's absolutely brutal unless you have that farmer's brain, which most people do, which is the slow and steady incremental improvement life. Now, slow and steady incremental improvement life for me, that doesn't work. That doesn't work because my brain is geared and it's wired to turn over every motherfucking rock for opportunity, to turn over every stone, to, to brave my own path, to be at the tip of the spear, to be a fucking firebrand, to be a trailblazer. That's always been my shtick. My shtick was I always wanted to push the human limits and see how far I could go on my own, on my own. I was always autodidactic. You know, when I was when I was little, I was forced into taking a lot of lessons. Uh, I tried to learn guitar. I tried to learn bass and I hated it. I couldn't even learn guitar because when the teacher would sit in front of me and show me how to play guitar, I felt way too constrained and restricted. You know what I mean? Four strings 
four strings and I understand that you can concoct an infinitesimal amount of music out of those four strings, but it just felt too restricted for me. You know what I mean? Like I just, it, it just didn't make sense. I'm not, I'm not wired that way. So anytime I would go into a lesson or try to learn how to shoot hoops or fucking swing a baseball bat, get any kind of coaching, I was extremely, extremely defiant of any kind of technique. I learned every fucking technique, every sport I ever did. I had to figure it out on my own. Didn't want to coach, didn't want any authority. Let me fucking dive in and let me figure it the fuck out. And so when I got into high school, my home life was so brutal. I, I hated coming home from school every day because I, despite the fact that I did grow up in an affluent home, I had parents who reinforced the system and they were, they were buyers. They really, really bought into the idea that if you want to be somebody, you got to get a college degree. You got to fucking go through the system. You got to slog away every day, incremental step by step. And that shit never, ever jived with me for even a millisecond. And no matter what they did, no matter how hard they try to bury me underground, I would grow. I would grow. You know, there's just some seeds that you can't bury. There's some spirits that are so hardened and callous that there's really no genetic programming that you can put on them that's not going to make them fucking fight back. In fact, I, my theory is that there are some genetic specimens that if you put them under enough pressure and enough stress and enough strain, they're actually going to blossom even harder than they would have been if you had just left them alone. And in my case, this seems to be the truth. When I was in high school, I... The, the depression of waking up every morning and having to go to the classroom another day, I just couldn't do it anymore. I couldn't do it anymore. It was breaking me because I knew I was wasting so much fucking time. I had zero interest. But here's the thing. I was a bad student, but I was a big learner. So anything that I wanted to learn on my own, I could fucking grasp concepts so fast. I could teach myself anything, but I couldn't sit in a fucking algebra class. I just couldn't do it. I'd fucking fall asleep. My eyes would be closing. I'd purposely fucking sabotage my grades. They didn't know what to do with me. My parents didn't know what to do with me. They thought, they, they told me I was lazy. They told me I was lazy because they didn't have the tools. They didn't have the skill set. They didn't have the mental cognition to understand that they just had a child that just wasn't built for this shit. And so what they did is they reinforced it through intense draconian style punishment fucking basically corporal punishment when i wouldn't behave in a way that was in alignment with the rules i would just get fucking grounded every fucking day i was always always getting in trouble and i had a younger brother and i would just take the heat for everything so i was just getting fucking just berated and fucking lambasted every fucking day of my life it never ended it never ended. I'm always in some kind of trouble for talking back, thinking a different way. Always busted. Always grounded. Can't go out. Cars being taken away. Can't fucking go out on a Friday night. Getting my phone fucking taken away. Whatever the fuck it was. I was always getting grounded. And this created, obviously, a force of nature that was brewing. You know what I mean? They had no idea that what they were doing is they were brewing a specimen who was eventually going to fucking break out of that local minima. You know what I mean? Because that local minima is brutal. And like I said, when you're 15, 16 years old and you're in high school, you don't really understand the context of reality. You don't really understand that there's a massive, massive world out there where anything is possible. And that's the problem is it's very easy to be myopic and it's very easy to let that worldview just cave in upon you and surrender because everywhere you turn, you got everyone fucking reinforcing this and shoving it down your throat that you're supposed to just do things the proper way. But there is no proper way of doing things. That's not a real thing. There's no fucking proper way of doing things. And so what happens is, is in this modern landscape, you, you often find that parents will want things for you that you don't want for yourself. 
and, and you have to deconstruct this. You have to deconstruct this and you have to see the insanity in that. You have to see the insanity in ever wanting something for someone that they don't want for themselves. You know what I mean? Like that makes zero sense. Like I have friends that have turned into losers. I can't want them to fucking change more than they want to change themselves. How the fuck does that mechanism even work? It doesn't. It doesn't. That's not love. That's pure fucking selfishness. That's pure selfishness because if the lifestyle, look, first of all, you have to understand every lifestyle is profitable. Every lifestyle that you choose is profitable. I do not believe that anyone has chosen to take an unprofitable lifestyle. Even the lazy loitering motherfucker on the couch all day has chosen the path of least resistance for himself. He's figuring out a way to fucking survive. So there's no such thing as any kind of adaptation. Everybody in, on earth, even the biggest fucking losers, are choosing a path for themselves that has benefits and profit. Or they wouldn't be doing it. You know what I mean? Because the human organism is parsimonious. It's very parsimonious and it's very economical with its resources. And it will defend you. Your, your body will defend any viewpoint that you decide to take because the body is that clever and it's that creative. It will do that for you. And that's what I talk about when I'm telling you that what happens is, is people go on autopilot because they don't understand that they've been bombarded. They've been bombarded by schools, by hospitals, by doctors, by authority figures, by parents who maybe their intentions are well-meaning. Maybe they are, but that's motherfucking irrelevant when you have a, a soul that's on fire and you're trying to fucking make something of yourself. Your, your problems when you are trying to reinvent yourself are supposed to be incomprehensible. Do you understand? They are supposed to, no one is supposed to understand the pain that you're going through because it's unique to you. Nobody's supposed to have a fucking hold on that shit. Nobody, you know? And so my home life was so wretched. It was so cold because there was nothing, there was nothing for me there. And so it would just be me grinding my antlers against my family members every fucking day. My antlers are clashing up against theirs. And it was like, eventually something was going to fucking break. So when I was in high school, when I would get home from school, my outlet was actually basketball. And I would just go into the gym with my brother and I would fucking practice five or six hours a day. And I developed a wicked, wicked fucking jump shot. Wicked. I mean, this thing was fucking filthy. And then I started playing high school basketball and I started torching and just fucking igniting motherfuckers because it was the only outlet that I had. The only outlet that I had, I had no freedom. Everyone was pushing on me. Everyone's telling me, be quiet, sit down, learn, fucking get good grades. I didn't want any of that. So I'm like 15 years old and I'm like, I need to compete in a local arena. I need to find something. I don't give a fuck how trivial or how fucking basic it is. I don't care how facile it is. I need to get myself in some kind of competitive environment to rise rank. To rise rank. I need to fucking prove myself. I need to fucking show my talent in some fucking form or capacity, some shape or form, because I'm just being fucking smashed every day. I'm being smashed to pieces. No one understands that I don't fucking want to be here. I don't want to be going to class. No one knows what to do. So I'm just like, all right, I'm just going to fucking start fucking imposing my will in an arena where it makes sense. So then I started to find that through athletics, and through shooting hoops in the gym and just getting real good. I mean, I was, I, was, I was a fanatic. I was obsessed with the game. I would fucking practice every fucking day. And then I would go home and my mom would be like, you're fucking lazy. You don't want to work. You don't want to go to school. But I'm like, in my head, I'm like, how the fuck am I lazy? I'm getting up at 5 a.m. before school even starts. And I'm running, two mi I'm running two miles in the street. And then I come home and I had a little fucking weight bench. I'm fucking bench pressing. I'm working out. I'm doing body style workout, bodybuilding style workouts when I'm 15 motherfucking years old. There's nothing lazy about me. It's the opposite. I'm just disenchanted and I'm disenfranchised by a system who doesn't cater to motherfuckers who want to build their own path. It's that simple. But it's very easy because when you're a kid, 
You are very impressionable by, by your parents. You're impressionable. And you want to fucking, you want to make them proud. But there was just something in me that couldn't fucking accept it. So when I would step onto that court, it was the only fucking outlet in my life where I could actually impose my will and see what it was like to fucking break other motherfuckers down. You know what I mean? Like if you've been in athletics, you know the high, you know the euphoria of snapping someone's ankles on a basketball court and nailing a fucking three and swishing it. And just watching your opponent slowly be fucking worn down and ground down and lose their morale. Like, you know what that's like over the course of a full pickup basketball game. You know what I'm saying? You're just breaking ankles. You're fucking in the zone. I mean, I was unconscious. I was unconscious at times. I was just on a fucking heater, on a fucking tear. I couldn't miss. I'm just nailing shots from everywhere. And I'm channeling the fury. And I'm channeling the fucking deep anger that I have at home. Where I'm not getting any support. I ain't getting any love. So I'm going on the basketball court and I'm just torching motherfuckers. And I have a chip on my shoulder and I am a sore fucking loser. When I would lose or there was a good defender on me who would stuff me and it was hard to get by, I would, I would absolutely fucking come unglued. I was so fucking frustrated. And I knew from an early age that I had that competitive spirit. I hated it. I was the, the biggest fucking poor sport you've probably ever witnessed in your life. When I'd play video games with someone, like one of my fucking friends from school, and they'd be whooping me, I would just go fucking rip the fucking power cord out before they could officially beat me. I mean, I was just absolutely hell-bent competitive. And when I did anything recreationally, I treated it very seriously. I took it personal. Like when I played basketball with my friends, I didn't know who the fuck you were on the court. We can shake hands afterwards and be boys, but while we're competing, I don't know who the fuck you are. I just take it personal that you think you can beat me. And I'm going to fucking come at you with every fucking thing I have when we compete. And like I said, we can shake hands afterwards. But that was the kind of spirit that I had in me my whole fucking life. And I finally found an outlet to channel it properly. You know what I mean? So it's like these, these little tiny things that happen in your life, you don't realize till way later on that that shit was saving my life because I was being suffocated at home. I was being suffocated. And so finally I found an outlet where all of a sudden I'm getting fucking respect because I'm fucking good. I'm talented. And I'm in there every day fucking training, sweating my ass off, working on my jumper. I was a lefty, so I was hard to guard, et cetera, et cetera. So you see where I'm going with that. And then... It got to the point where my mom eventually kind of lost patience. She lost her cool. She couldn't figure out why my grades were so bad. And she forced me to go to therapy. And this is, I think, when I was like 14. So she drags me into a therapist's office and she's like, we need to, we need to have like an, an intervention. We need some kind of mediation to figure out how to get you enthusiastic about school and how to get you on the right track. But keep in mind, I already knew I was on the right track. I already knew on the, I was on the right track, but I was only 14. So I didn't really have any proof in the pudding. I didn't really have any fucking way of expressing that. I just knew it internally. So she drags me to a therapist one day, and I'll never forget this. The therapist. So she, she tells me to go to the, she tells me to meet her at the therapist office, which was literally five minute walk from my house down the street. So I walked to the office at a certain time and I noticed that my mom's car was there. And I was like, this is fucking weird. So I walk into the lobby and I see my mom come out of the office where I'm supposed to sit down for therapy. And she's like, I was like, what's going on? And she was like, I just did an hour session to kind of set the tone. Right now, as a youngster who's already been through the fucking gauntlet with authority figures in school that are fake a ton of a ton of fucking you know pressure at home with people fucking telling me what to do and telling me how to fuck how, how to do things correctly i was already very skeptical very very skeptical of any kind of authority so when she brought me into that office and she had told me that she had already done an hour session but this was the first time i was supposed to meet the therapist i took a huge affront to that I felt like my trust was broken. And so when I went into the therapist's office, I sat down and I'm only 14. And I told the therapist, I said, listen, I said, I cannot 
go any further with this. I said, I cannot have you as my therapist. And the lady said, why? And I said, because the integrity has already been fucking ruined. And she goes, what do you mean? And I said, well, my mom just came in here and already gave you an oil painting. She came in here before me and already gave you some kind of bias by injecting her perspective into the mix. And I said, the whole thing is fucking corrupted. It's, it's corrupted. There's no way I can have an impartial session with you going forward. You are always, the foundation is now built on zero integrity because you're always going to have a colored perspective based on what she told you. And I didn't think that was fair. I didn't think it was fair to shove me in a fucking position where now I have to battle against a perspective that was already embedded in the therapist's mind. And I just remember the therapist, my mom was sitting there when I said all this and the therapist looked at her and she fucking shook her head and kind of like put her hands up. And she was like, I kind of get it. She was like, he's smart. That's what she said to my mom. And I left office and I didn't fucking, I didn't go through with the therapy. But do you see my point here? My point here is that it gets to a point where when you're trying to live the way that you want to live, especially as a youngster, and no one is supporting you, you develop really, really good instincts for manipulation. Because I felt like that was a complete fucking manipulative move. Like, you're going to throw me into a situation where there's already a bias that's been implanted. Fuck that. If I'm going to talk to a therapist at all... It's going to be on brand new fucking terms. It's going to be, it's going to be mano y mano. It's going to be me on you. You know what I mean? And so I just took that as a very, very affronting, insulting fucking thing. And so those instincts were quickening and those instincts were sharpening as I kept going through this journey. You know what I mean? And then the other huge breach of trust, the other huge breach of trust, and I know a lot of you can probably relate to this on some level, is... I remember being picked up from school one day in high school by my mom and she had a fucking literally a, like a costume, like a fucking wardrobe sitting in like a plastic wrapping. And I was like, what is this? And she was like, I got you a job. And I was like, what are you talking about? She was like, I got you a job at the grocery store. You're going to be a fucking bagger. And I was like, what? I didn't fucking agree to this. And she was like, yeah, this is, you're going to do this. You're going to save up money. You're going to buy a car. Um, I'm going to match half of the car, et cetera. And she was like, yeah, working jobs that you don't like builds character. You know what I mean? Like I could fucking, I could do a two hour spaces on the, on how bullshit that is. But my point is, is I was constantly being thrown into shit that I didn't want to do. And le let me tell you something, the existential dread that I felt when I had to put on that fucking out outfit. This was when I had like a, this is when you could get work permits in America when you were like 15 and a half. I wasn't even old enough to drive and I was forced to work this job. And the gro this grocery store, it was Vons, is the most hideous fucking place on earth. It's worse than the DMV. It's soulless, soulless, lifeless people hobbling around that are fucking using coupons and shit. And I'm just, I literally feel like I was in Arkham Asylum. I was in fucking Arkham Asylum. I'm just like, can someone please just fucking anesthetize me? Because this is fucking insane. I'm working like 40 hours a week and I'm not even joking at the time. I want to say minimum wage was like $7.50. It was absurd. My paychecks were like 200 bucks for a full fucking week of work. And I'm just in there and, and I'm in there every day after school. I had to go to this job and I'm just like, there has to be more to life than this. There's no fucking way. There is no, there's not a snowball's chance in hell that this is the only path in life. There's just no fucking way. And it was just bloody torture. I felt like I was on a torture rack and I knew I had to go. I knew I had to fucking go. I knew I had to leave the nest. I had to get the fuck out of this house, out of this space, and take full responsibility for my life as soon as possible. And those of you who've been on SoundCloud and have heard my, my old origin story from about two years ago, you know that at 17, I bounced. I bounced. I let everything fucking burn and die and rot, and I went and embarked on my own fucking life and started to express myself the way I wanted to motherfucking express myself. And it was the harshest, most 
intense experience that I've ever gone through, but it was the most uplifting as well. It was like a benediction. You know what I mean? Like I could finally fucking start taking the shots that I wanted to take and fucking be responsible for that. And that's all I ever wanted. All I ever wanted was the authority to just run my own life. And please, like I will deal with the consequences for every decision that I make. That's not a problem. But I just need the freedom and I need the opportunity to do that. I need the fucking freedom and opportunity to do that. And, you know, we didn't have a male figure in the house. Me and my younger brother, I raised him. Me and him would get into fist fights all the time on the basketball court because I just had this fucking chip on my shoulder. If he would fucking defend me well or block me, I'd start talking shit. Me and him got into a ton. Me and my brother almost put each other in the hospital several, several times before the age of 18. Like, I remember throwing him through a bush. I threw him through my neighbor's bush in a fight on the court. And literally three years later, you could still see the silhouette cut out from where I threw his body through the bush. It never grew back. It was insane. And we would just fucking, we'd give each other fucking bloody noses, fucking just fuck each other up all the time. And, and so it's like the whole fucking household was fucking imploding. You know what I mean? It was fucking imploding. And then, you know, you introduce a stepfather into the fucking equation. That's a whole nother fucking case of insanity. I, I have zero respect, zero for another man who steps in and tries to take care of another woman's kids. I think it's absolutely the most cuck beta fucking sexual strategy I've ever seen. And I, I just have zero respect for it. And I was man of the house. I was man of the house taking care of my brother. And all of a sudden this new dude moves in with my mom. My stepdad just comes into the house out of the fucking blue and he's the new man of the house. And I was like, nah, 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 nah. This, this isn't how this works. And I was in high school. I was in fucking high school and I was like, bro, how the fuck, like, how dumb can you possibly to be to think that you can just introduce another man into a home with two fucking almost grown boys and think that everything's going to be fucking cohesive? It was insane. So, you know, it's like my territory at home was essentially being encroached. And so I just had zero freedom left. I didn't even feel like my home was my home. I didn't feel like my room was my room. I had nothing. So I was like, I'm just, I'm going to dip. So I dipped at 17. You know what I mean? And then the, the, the real fucking sparks in me just started to fucking come out. And I had to decondition and deprogram myself for years. It took such a long time to dissolve the interior voice of all these teachers and authority figures in my head. It took a long fucking time. A lot of practice, a lot of reps, a lot of just doing whatever I thought was right, learning the hard way. Learning the real hard way, by the way. Like, I, I had made the same mistakes hundreds of times in a row. Hundreds of fucking times in a row I had to make the same mistakes before I learned. And that's the way I wanted it. That's the way I wanted it. I wanted to just to have the freedom and the flexibility to be able to do things on my fucking terms. And that's how it had to be. And so once I left the nest from an early age, that's when everything started to fucking make sense. Everything about life started to make perfect fucking sense. There's a whole nother fucking cosmos out here than the one that I was doing before. There's a whole nother world where you actually do have the freedom to do whatever the fuck you want every moment of the day and be responsible for yourself. There's a way of doing that. But no one ever tells you this. No one ever tells you this. It's through immense pain and suffering and having a fucked up childhood that you finally come to the conclusion Wait a minute. This was all a hazy delusion. You know what I mean? You can grab the steering wheel of life and you can fucking take this motherfucker in any direction that you choose to go. And it's just the most liberating feeling on earth. I would have rather slept under a rock than slept another night in a household where we had that kind of combativeness and that kind of clashing of forces every day. It made zero sense to stay. Zero. You know what I mean? It's a sink or swim thing. It's a sink or swim thing. And sometimes when you just throw yourself in the pool, you're going to start figuring out how to swim. And, and it really does. It, it really is kind of a simple philosophy. It gets really fucking simple after a while, you know, and then it's just living a fucking fast life. From that moment on, I lived a very, very fast life. And, and someone recently asked me and they said, what do you think? the biggest contribution to your success has been 
in your life up to this point? And I said, I can endure pain. I can endure more pain than anybody that I know. And I truly believe that's my fucking edge. I can endure an immense amount of fucking pain. And I know how to juggle it and I know how to barrel through and I know how to get on the other side. I also know how to harness and channel the negative emotions that I have. And that comes from years, years of just being brutalized and having nobody believe in you. Nobody believing in you. Zero. No one even fucking understands the path that you want to take. You know what I mean? Like no one gets it. Nobody does. And they don't have to. They don't have to. Like that's the that's the fuck one of the grandest liberations you can ever go through in your life. The true the true transformative experience is understanding that no one has to understand the path you're on whatsoever. Nobody. They don't even have to grasp it on a on a fucking subliminal level. It, it doesn't matter. Like you are here to express your genetic destiny. Your your whole mission as a man, it's why you're born with the hardware that you have is to see how far you can climb. What the fuck else is there to do? What, what the fuck else is there to do with your time but see how far you can push your limits and see how far you can go beyond what you're supposed to be on paper, beyond what everybody says you were supposed to be, beyond what your genetic fault line is. Like, why wouldn't you want to transcend beyond that? You know what I mean? Like, that's the best fuel on earth. That's an infinite, green, clean supply of fuel that you have the rest of your fucking life. Is just having doubt and disbelief around you everywhere. You know what I mean? Like, I don't do, any, I don't do anything the technically correct way. I never have. Even that fucking nasty, wicked, filthy jump shot that I had that was fucking lethal... By the way, I had the fucking record for three-pointers in a game on my varsity high school team for like 10 years. I was just roasting motherfuckers. Even the shot was fucking janky. It was janky as fuck. It was a very, very ugly-looking jumper. It was like my arms had to outstretch way above my head. My technique was not good at all. It was a very unorthodox style of basketball. But it worked for me. And this is what I'm telling you. There's really no fucking proper way to do, to do anything. And what I've realized about coaching, about trainers, about things in general is, you know, you get a guy with a lot of quirks, you know what I mean? Or like a movement pattern or some kind of technique, some kind of tactic that he uses in life that works really well for him. And then people will step in and be like, dude, that's not how you're supposed to swing the golf club. You know what I mean? That's not how you're supposed to approach business. That's not how you're supposed to do this. And what they do is they try to correct you know what I mean? They're trying to correct an overcompensation that makes you fucking stand out. It makes you phenomenal. If you look at every fucking phenomenal athlete phenom, Usain Bolt, they all have very, very asymmetrical movement patterns. They're very asymmetrical because when you're asymmetric, I want you to understand this. It does give you a kind of propulsion that being symmetrical doesn't give you. You know what I mean? That's a fucking metaphor for life. That's why the ugly motherfucker, uh, an ugly man has more upside with women than good looking men do because he's got the asymmetry. And so he's going to develop a host of character patterns on top of that. That's going to obviously give him more of a shot at the highest echelon of women. That's a fact. That's a fucking fact because everybody regresses to the mean. So what I realized is, is when I would go see a coach or I'd be in an Olympic lifting gym and my feet are, my setup's not right. You know what I mean? I'm pulling a little too hard on the left. Every motherfucker who's trying to correct me, that's trying to make me symmetrical, that's going to make you average. Symmetry equals average. Understand this. This is, this is like parochial wisdom. And, and it's also a liability thing. There's coaches that they are training athletes. They want them to have perfect fucking symmetrical form. Well, that's a liability protection. They want an athlete to have perfect symmetrical form because they don't want that motherfucker getting hurt. Your chances of getting injured and hurt when you're symmetrical are a lot lower than they are if you're asymmetrical. But the force production of being asymmetrical gives you a lot higher upside. Do you understand? So it's dangerous. Life is the same way. When you live a symmetrical life, your chances of getting lucky your chances of getting any kind of divine benevolence, any kind of divine benediction, almost go to zero. But it's through asymmetry that beauty is expressed, that, that entropy is maximized. You know what I mean? So, like, I would never fix my setup. 
in the gym and I was just fucking crushing motherfuckers. I was crushing motherfuckers on the court. I was crushing motherfuckers in any activity that I picked up. I dominated and got good very quickly just doing it my way. You know what I mean? I tried a golf coach one time to fucking correct my swing. I wanted to fucking snap the club in half off the front of my fucking kneecap. I got so frustrated. He kept telling me, nah, that's not the right way. Yet I'm blasting, I'm blasting balls into the fucking troposphere. Yeah, my accuracy was a little bit of fuck, but was a little bit fucked, but I could have fine-tuned that. I just couldn't fucking do it. Everything I did was autodidactic. Let me jump in and I'll fucking learn the hard way. I will figure it out because I'm fucking relentless. And I will put in the reps. I'll put, I will fucking live and breathe whatever it is that I choose to do until I get proficient at it. That's always been my style. That's why I've always said how you really can tell a lot about a man, about their character, by how they behave when they do recreational activity. The recreational activity is actually who you really are. That's you unmasked. If you play pickup basketball and you're lazy and you don't want to fucking defend and you don't want to fucking help out on a pick and roll and you're a lazy motherfucker and you treat it lighthearted, ha, 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 I don't care if I get fucking rained on. That's who you really are. That's your character. Because your character always comes out in practice and recreation and fun. Fun is the truest expression of a man's heart. Do you understand? Because the real thing, when it comes time to perform in a real match or a real competition, that's when the mask actually comes on. You know what I mean? That's when everything is very curated, very manicured. There's, there's really none of the imperfections exist. So who you are in recreation is who you really are. Understand this. That's why... You know, anytime I see a motherfucker who plays any game or even something that's supposed to be light and fun and they take it seriously, I'm like, that's a fucking hunter. That's a shark right there. That motherfucker's going places because he's not investing time into anything that's not serious. You know what I mean? Like anything you do as a man, you should take fucking seriously. You have to take things very seriously before you can keep them lighthearted, if that makes sense. So that when it does come time to come up on stage and do the grand performance, it just looks effortless. It's, it's sprezzatura. You know what I mean? It's just complete fucking sprezzatura. And so for me, like I told you, after high school, when I started fucking battling life and taking life by the horns on my own fucking terms, and I started to understand that the 250K year salary would not augment my life any more than being on, I'm not even kidding, a 4K a month salary. Like, what what could you really fucking do on 200K a year that you can't do on, like, 5K a month? Food is covered 100%. Shelter is covered. Okay, I can't fly private. I can't fly first class. Who gives a fuck? Okay, my car is going to be a little bit shittier. But I still got all bases covered. So not only am I not working a middle-class job for a salary, there's no golden carrot. I can fucking hustle deals left and right, make a little bit of cheddar every month, but I'm a free man. I can rove around the world and do whatever the fuck I want to do. I can walk into a misty tavern if I want to. I can go into the fucking wilderness if I want to. I can fucking go talk to anybody. I can walk into any storefront. I can make fast relations. I can go to any city on zero, basically zero income. Basically fucking zero income. And so I realized what a fucking trap the middle was. And that's why I never wanted to go to college. And why the fuck would I invest another six years into becoming an employee? Makes zero sense. I'd rather be dirt poor because even when I would win huge bets as a youngster, because I played high stakes poker for a long time and I'd play cash games, I'd win. I'd rattle off 300K when I was like 24. Life didn't change at all. Life didn't change. I could maybe get a few more fancy dinners and kind of have money on the sideline, but I never wanted that. I never wanted that. It's almost like in life, like you truly, your life really doesn't fucking change until you do have millions of dollars. It's just a fucking fact. Like the golden carrot, the golden handcuffs, the salary shit. It's just your life's not that much better than the guy who's making no money, but he doesn't have to wear a goofy suit. You know what I mean? Like he can walk anywhere the fuck he wants to walk during the day. Like that's instant status. That's quick status. If you see a motherfucker at noontime in a coffee shop doing whatever the fuck he wants to do, that motherfucker's higher status than you. You make more money than him, but he's having more fun. He's free. 
So like my whole life philosophy has been built around the idea that like, there's no point in reaching for the middle. I would rather have nothing. I'd rather be the biggest fucking zero on earth. Cause I'm still healthy. I still got a roof over my head. I still got everything that 95% of men would want. And I'm having a great time and I'm free and I'll work on projects and I'll throw spaghetti at the wall and I'll take monster, monster risks with the cash that I do make. And I will be ferocious and fucking relentless with my risk taking until I hit the fucking massive payday. And then I just fucking took leap. I took a quantum leap. And now I had a great time. I have life experience because I'm traveling around. I'm having fun. I'm walking into storefronts. I'm getting myself into fucking crazy situations throughout the day. Guess what? When I hit my huge lick, it might take years. When I hit my huge lick, I got way more money than the middle class motherfucker. And I got all the life experience and stories to tell. All you need is one. Bi- it's all about that first big swing in life. All you need is one fucking home run. All you need is a motherfucking grand slam one time. And it's game over. You wipe all the pieces off the board. So my whole philosophy has just been about that. I'm going to take indiscriminate risk. And I'm going to try to build a system that can outrun my bad habits. That's been my whole fucking mantra. If you have bad habits that you don't want to get rid of, you better build a fucking engine that, that can outrun it, that can beat it. Like we talked about Michael Jordan. You know what I mean? Made so much money that he, he, he doesn't have a gambling problem. He's just seen as eccentric. So it's like if you're going to leave leaks and you're going to leave flaws and holes in your game, Because there's behaviors that you like to indulge in, whether it's fucking too much alcohol or you fucking smoke three packs a day. You have to be very arduous and militant about counteracting those effects. You know what I'm saying? So it's like if you are a what they quote unquote call a functional alcoholic, you better have a really fucking strict regimen around that of health. You better be fucking lifting. You better be a fucking fitness maniac. You better be fucking eating right because then whatever you're indulging in becomes the reward. Do you understand the difference? Rather than fucking doing all the fucking degenerate shit all fucking day and then rewarding yourself with lazy and comfort, you fucking turn yourself into a machine. You get your work done. You fucking bang it out and then you fucking use that as your reward system. That's the only way you can do it is you have to build a system that's going to outrun the entropy from the bad habits that you have. It's the only way it can be done. You know what I mean? And my fast paced, quick witted lifestyle that I've, that I fucking illustrated on my last basis, you know, it's, it's like I had this very Zen Buddhist detachment to everything. Anything life would throw at me, any situation that I would get myself into, I had an absolute coolness and confidence about whatever it was that was going to be either taken away from me or how bountiful it was. I was just rolling with the fucking punches. I remember when I was in my early 20s, I won a ton of money in a poker game and I bought myself an E-class and the E-class was pretty dope at the time. And it was fucking brand new. And I was on the freeway in LA and a motherfucker smashed me into the car in front of me. And my car turned into an accordion. It was literally a fucking accordion. It was crunched. I wasn't hurt, but I got out of the car and I fucking lit up a cig and the guy's fucking coming over, waving his hands. And I'm just standing there looking at the situation. And I'm like, like, The first thing that dawned on me to give you an an idea of the perspective and the mindset was, okay, the chances that I'm actually going to wait here and fill out paperwork and fill out reports and then call my fucking insurance company, fill out another fucking affidavit, then fucking have to tow my car, send it to a fucking repair shop, worry about how long that's going to take. Dude, this is a microcosm of my whole fucking life's philosophy. When that car got totaled, I walked off the freeway on ramp and those who are, I have a few buddies on Twitter who are super close to me. They know this story. I walked off the on ramp and I let the car burn. I I have to this day, I have no idea what the fuck happened to the car. I didn't fucking talk to a tow truck. I didn't talk to anybody. I left the car on the fucking freeway and dipped and dipped. And I was like in the fucking 
six week process that I would have to do stressing, sitting on my fucking thumbs, waiting for this car to be fully fucking replaced, repaired, whatever the fuck the insurance company was going to do. If I put my mind to it, I can go get an S class in the same amount of fucking time that I'm waiting for this E class to be repaired. Cause I know I'm going to be in a battle frenzy when I get home. Now I have no car. I have no car, but I don't give a fuck. Cause I'm detached. The car was never, the car was never an extension of me. It was something that was fun and it was temporary. And I've always held everything in life in that temporary kind of lighthearted fashion of like holding on to it tightly, but also not too loose. So you don't crack the egg type of thing. Like that's sort of just been my, my, one of my, the biggest gifts that God has given me is I've been so able to just roll with the waves. I've been able to roll with the punches. I walked off the fucking freeway car disappeared like man on fire and fucking Denzel Washington went home. Listen to me. I was so fucking throttled and enraged that I now didn't have a car. I didn't have time or the energy or the capacity to sit at home languishing. You know what I mean? Like th there was no way I'm going to sit in front of a fucking console and numb myself out. There's no way I'm going to be watching porn. There's no way I'm going to be wasting my time reading about fucking Schopenhauer. I don't have a car. So the ferocity, the archangel that was hovering over my shoulder to go get that car replaced, it was undeniable. I would wake up in a fever pitch every fucking morning, basically in a fucking deep sweat. Like, okay. I now have to assemble some of the greatest deals I've ever assembled. I got to go make sales. I have to stay ahead of the curve and beat what I see as a foot race between me and the imaginary insurance company who would have taken fucking forever to get me my car back. I don't want a rental. I do not want a fucking car rental. I don't want this easy. I'm going to go out and I'm going to fucking resummon everything in my body and mind and I am going to go overkill the situation. I'm not just trying to replace the E-class. I'm going to go get an S-class now. And that's what I'm going to do. And I'm going to use the pain and the suffering and the torture of being stuck on foot and being stuck at home every fucking day. And I'm going to have to use this energy and this anger to go produce something. And that's what I did. I obsessively 24 hours a day around the clock put my conscious mind to sleep. And I let the genius and the brilliance of the unconscious mind that was so frustrated that now I had to walk to Whole Foods to get a steak and I couldn't fucking drive, come up with the ideas and the fucking creativity to come up with a fucking solution. And that's when I assembled the fucking sales team. And that's when I started riding my fucking horses really fucking hard. That's when I started racing the horses that I had built. Friends of mine that I had helped them curate their mindset to become killer salesmen. And I fucking punctured it. And I overkilled the situation and I ended up getting the S class in a faster amount of time than the fucking E class. And so that was me being in control of my fucking destiny and understanding because this all circles back into my original point about the system. The system is so fucking gay and slow on purpose to demoralize people. Why the fuck does it take two months to file an insurance report and get an insurance refund? Like why? Because they want Everybody mired in the Gregorian calendar and getting used to the fucking archaic dinosaur slowness of banks. It's 2023, fellas. You're telling me banks don't have the technology to make instant wire transfers and ACHs? Get the fuck out of here. Banks take forever to clear money because they want you in that mindset of being a slow grinder. You're not an innovator. You're not an innovator. You're an employee and they're reinforcing that message. These bank times are going to be slow. You don't have a choice, sir. You got to fucking wait. No, no, no. I ain't waiting for anybody. I'm going to throw myself into the fucking action right the fuck now. And if you won't transfer the money fast for me, I'm going to get someone else to cover it. And if they won't cover it, I'm going to find someone else to cover it. You know what I mean? And so you realize the banks are fucking with you. The whole system's fucking with you. They're slowing down your money. They fucking take forever to make fucking deposits. Shit doesn't fucking clear on time. PayPal holds this. Fucking this fucking platform holds this. Cash app bans you here. Kraken shuts down your crypto here. And you just realize the whole thing is designed for the farmer brain. It's designed to just make you a little corn-fed little fucking monkey who's just accepting the little peanuts that they throw you every day. But you realize there's a better way of going about it. Because when the banks do that to you enough times, 
and the insurance companies and you got all this red tape and you're on hold for three fucking hours just to get a very small issue resolved, it turns you into a monster. You're just like, why the fuck is the system like this? So it turns you into a kind of renegade where you're just like, you know what? I need to find my own system. I need to go outside the bounds and confinements of what society is offering me. And I need to create my own fucking systems. And it's going to be a hundred times more inconvenient. It's going to be a hundred times more inconvenient finding a nice slick setup to move money around. But it's going to be worth it in the end because you got your balls intact. You know what I mean? You got your balls intact. Like, why the fuck are you waiting for these institutions to dispel shit? It makes zero fucking sense. I, I refuse to go through the dehumanization process of dealing with insurance companies. I refuse to do it. I don't give a fuck how much money they owe me. I am going to pretend that check does not exist. And I'm going to go on a motherfucking heroic mission and do some fucking big boy plays. And I'm going to go get three times what I'm owed. That's the fucking mentality that you have to have. If you're truly trying to be a fucking trailblazer and you want to get out of the system, you have to be willing to go through the fucking inconvenience of building your own fucking systems. It's, you know, it's like we can go on and on and on about how bullshit the whole thing is. The FICO score. That's a fucking antiquated mechanism as well. You know what I mean? That is anti-community. It's anti-tribe. The fucking FICO score. Because what it is, is it's making you depend upon an institution. You know what the real FICO score is? Do you guys actually want to know what the real, true FICO score is? It's having a network. It's having a group of homies that you can hit up at fucking 1 o'clock in the morning and say, yo, transfer me a million bucks in USDC. That's your real FICO score. Your real FICO score is how many motherfuckers do you know on your squad? That if you were in a horrific jam, would come in and bail you out with a cash loan. That's your fucking FICO score right there. Why the fuck do you need to get a loan from a bank when you could have spent the first decade of your life getting a network of bad motherfuckers who have cash to throw around? There's your fucking FICO. There's your bank loan. And it's, it's, it's fucking instant approval. They'll transfer you the money in five seconds. So the whole credit thing's bullshit. Because your real credit score is with the homies that you got. You understand? You understand? So we can break down the system does things slowly on purpose because it wants to push you back. It says, don't innovate. Don't be industrious. Let the guys who already have those reins, let us keep reigning supreme. We don't want you breaking out of the local minima. We don't want you breaking out of the local minima. Just fucking focus on your little fucking 800 FICO. It's wonderful. If you ever want to get a loan, don't worry, buddy. We got you. It'll take three months. Do you guys understand what an eternity three months is? Do you know what can be accomplished in three months of concerted effort? I don't think anybody truly understands what an eternity that an eternity that is. Or when just people put things on hold in general. It's fucking absurd. Like, why are you waiting at the DMV for fucking four hours? Like, like a rat. Like, why don't you pay someone a hundred bucks to wait in line for you? Go hang out at a coffee shop, and when your number gets ready to call, you just come in and switch places with them. Like, why aren't you getting creative? Why are you just fucking doing what you're told and just waiting in lines and waiting and waiting and waiting and waiting for a paycheck and waiting for this to happen and waiting for this to happen, and maybe one day this will happen? Why aren't you getting in front of the fucking problem? Yeah, you're going to make a hundred fucking mistakes. You're going to make way more mistakes than the average person. But you got that subconscious mind that's got your back. And that shit's going to bail you out of the situation nine out of fucking ten times. Nothing is not overcomable. Nothing. I've been under attack my whole fucking life. I've been under attack, under pressure, under stress, under strain, under pain. My entire fucking life. I've still figured out a way to fucking figure it all out. You know what I mean? I got debts right now that I'm fucking, fucking horseshoeing through. And it's going to be fucking great. It's going to be one of the best fucking comeback stories you've ever heard. And you know what? I'm filming the comeback story. I am filming my comeback story right now. You guys are going to see a rise, a meteoric rise that you ain't ever seen before. And I am documenting it live. I'm going to fucking release this to you to show what it's like to wake up and have 25 fucking problems hunkering you down on your back and still finding a way to be happy, content, and have the confidence and wherewithal and resolve to get ahead of these problems. 
I'm going to show you exactly what that fucking looks like. I'm going to show you what it's like to lose a million dollars on a game. I'm going to show you what it's like to lose fucking 12 bets in a row. I'm going to show you what it's like to win 17 bets in a row. I'm going to show you the euphoria too. I'm going to show you the good, the bad, the ugly. I'm going to show you how to manage it all. I'm going to show you how to become a creature, a creature that refuses to back down and refuses to surrender and doubles down on his nature and wins and successfully takes care of the people who've had their back. That's the name of the game. Your supporters, the people who have stood by you, you got to pay these motherfuckers back in, in spades. And if you're living true to your nature, you're going to make mistakes. You are going to do things that no one can fucking comprehend why you're doing it. But eventually, you know, they will understand. Do you get it? That's your fucking job. Your job is to prove everybody fucking wrong. And you know that on a long enough time interval, you are going to do it no matter what. That's it. That's the fucking juice you need. That's the gas in the tank. It all stems from there. Got to spark up a cig. I don't think I've taken a fucking breath in, what, 45 minutes? You guys don't know pressure. I'm telling you right now, you guys actually do not have any idea what fucking pressure looks like. What real pressure looks like. You know what I mean? Like, most of you young guys, you just got to take care of yourself. You don't even have kids. You don't have a family. I do. I do. I got a son. I got a family. I got to juggle that. I got to take care of you. Like the, the more things you have to take care of, the more responsibilities you have in your life, the better the organism responds. The better the or you are only going to rise to the level of the problems that you have. And if you don't have big problems, you're never going to come up with big solutions. It's just that fucking simple because civilization technology has erased 95% of the problems that we would ordinarily face. So it's like, you guys are shocked that degeneracy is rampant. You guys are shocked that the fucking crypto casinos are buzzing 24 hours a day. It's like life's problems are solved. No one really has anything to lose by taking monster mat monumental risks anymore because food is so easy to come by. Shelter's easy to come by. You ain't going to be homeless. So it's like everyone's just fucking shooting their shot now. Because society has fixed those base problems. They're fixed. They're, they're easily fucking fixable. Do you understand? We're not in a fucking survivalistic fucking hellscape like we used to be. Those days are over. So now everybody has the opportunity to pursue what they're here to fucking pursue. Unencumbered. Unencumbered. Unabashedly. You can take infinite fucking shots, and if you do it enough and you have the fucking conviction, you are guaranteed to hit a big lick in this life. I don't, I don't give a fuck how untalented you think you are. Every man has the opportunity. Every man gets their lick. Everybody does. Every man goes through their fucking phases where everything is just clicking and firing on all cylinders. And where you end up losing a lot of the magic as a man is when you're on a hot streak and you start trying to deconstruct and reverse engineer why you're on the hot streak. It's a huge fucking mistake that guys make. When things are clicking and things are working, that is the time where you throw analysis to the fucking boneyard and you don't fucking revive it. You don't resurrect it because the minute you start analyzing why you're on a thread of success is the very moment that that falls through your hands like sand. It's over. It's done. The magic is no longer captured. It is game over, my friend. You don't analyze a hot streak. Now, the sharp motherfuckers in this space will see how everything I'm saying constellates out of a lot of my central fucking theories, right? About the subconscious brain. Because that's letting the subconscious brain, the reptilian lizard brain, take over and do what it does best. All right, I'm going to spark this up for real this time. My younger brother's a fucking G, by the way. Dude's a fucking genetic freak. My, uh, my dad, um, in the 80s, tried out for the Oakland Raiders. My dad was a fucking phenomenal genetic specimen. My younger brother's like 6'3", 210 pounds, very talented fighter, 
had many, many underground fights when we were growing up. The guy's a fucking monster. I'm going to have to pull him up here on his spaces one of these days. And we're going to have to do a twin tandem. And he's going to have to share his fucking experience growing up, too. Because me and him have completely polar opposite perspectives of growing up. Completely polar opposite. But the bottom line is nobody could quell the fucking sparks in me. Nobody. Like, not no force. The only motherfucker that could stand in my way has been brute to force. I have always been the problem in my life. There's never been any obstacle or barrier put in front of me that I couldn't fucking figure out or solve. You know what I mean? I have the only person who's ever been able to take me down is myself. And the only way that I ever took myself down was by not channeling the fire in my soul in the proper direction. By denying who I am and not accepting myself for all my fucking imperfections. And trying to do fucking intense therapy work and introspection, which never fucking works. It doesn't work because all you can do when you introspect, when you journal, when you meditate, all you can do is rewrite a fictional tale in your head. That's all you're doing. You're rewriting history in your head. But what nobody understands is the past is malleable. The past is a viscous substance. Do you understand? The past is changeable. The past is the only thing that you can change in your life. You are never actually living in the present. Everything you do right now, every decision that you make is constantly redefining the past. You are always redefining it by what you're doing. You know what I'm saying? You get a dad who's very abrasive. He's very Im Im imperial. He's very hard on you. He's borderline abusive. You grow up to be a smashing success. You grow up to be a sensation. You grow up to be a starlet, right? Your perception of your father was that he was just a rock solid good guy who was a little bit hard on you, right? That's your perception. But you take that exact same carbon copy subject, your father, and you put him in a diorama, you put him in an alternative scenario where you grow up to be a bona fide loser. You will say that your father was abusive and that he was the worst tyrannical despotic figure that you had ever come across. Do you see how those two outcomes completely change the way the past was viewed? The past is always being redefined by your own success, by your accomplishments. What you do changes the actual meaning of it, and it actually changes it at a temporal level. It changes it at the per perceptional level as well. So the past is not fucking locked in. You can rewrite it all the time by avenging it, avenging the past. That's what men are here to do, by the way. They avenge the past. They don't let the past wear them down. They don't harp on it. They don't make it as their calling card. They don't fucking use it as a label to be a victim. They get a vengeance on it. They get their comeuppance on it. Do you understand the difference? One is fuel and one is hunkering you down and holding you down into a holding pattern that you can't break out of. So knowing that the past can always be redefined by what you're doing today, it is idiotic, idiotic to worry, bitch, moan, or complain about what happened yesterday. Because what you're doing right now is changing that at all times. I'm going to smoke another cig real quick. Jesus Christ, what... What could you possibly want to come up here and say after this? There's like a hundred plus requests. Let's see what the audience has to say. Yo, Nick, what's up, buddy? Hey, what how you doing? What do you got for us? Yeah, so... Um... I'm just lighting up a cig. Make sure okay. your make sure your question is interesting, please. Yeah, yeah. So uh, you know, we all know that you you, know, you you dabbled in gambling, right? And so you definitely got some gut wrenching losses. Um, Horrifying. Have you ever yeah. would, have, would have brought most men to their knees, brother? 
I've taken the blade. I've taken the blade to the liver more times than I can possibly count. My exoskeleton. If you could seriously unsheathe the skin on the base layer of my exoskeleton, I guarantee you, if you did an autopsy, my exoskeleton has scars on it that look like Zorro fucking slashed it with a fucking long sword. <laughs> it's fucking scarred, big dog. But yeah, go on. Uh, yeah. So, so that's that's precisely the the question is. How do you deal, like, I mean, have you ever dealt with low confidence after the fact? And how do you bounce back? Nah, dude. Like, how long? It's the opposite, brother. Listen, I have had my guts, my entrails actually torn out in front of me. Like, there were times in my 20s in my life where actually I would put everything at risk because, like, I had rent due or I had to pay bills or I had, like, a very urgent matter that I had to take care of. And I would take everything in my pocket, fly to Vegas, and bet on a match. And literally, I'm watching the match, and I know that my entire livelihood is dependent on the outcome of this shit. And when I would lose, dude, I would be absolutely fucking invigorated. Because I realized very quickly when you take massive shots and you lose, your life really doesn't change that much. It really doesn't. Like you, People always think this is the last time. This is like um, this is like the male myth in 2023. Everyone thinks, fuck, this was my last hope. This was my last opportunity. It's all over. But then you wake up the next day and you draw another breath and you're recharged and you're like, wait a minute. That was a foggy, fucked up perspective. That's not true. There's opportunity every fucking day. There's so much opportunity. There's so much beauty in life to behold of every day. It's like, why would I why would I care about what happened yesterday? The opportunities ahead are always better than the opportunities that left you. And I know I'm going to hit my big lick. You know, the, the gambler's paradox comes down to this. When you're when you have it and you're winning big, it's never as good as it seems. You know what I mean? I've had it. I've fucking I've told you the story. I had I had 17 million dollars free and clear debt free in 2017. 17 mil liquid. I torched all of it. I torched all of it because I didn't have a system and I didn't understand at the time. I was a little too emotionally immature to understand that as a man, if you want to live at the edge of life, you better have systems in place that are going to help you outrun it. I didn't have any systems in place. I was just cocky and I had a huge fucking chip on my shoulder. So I torched everything. But the, the point of the matter was, is that when you don't have the money and you lose, you think you're never going to be on top again. And those are both lies. Those are both lies. It is as good as it seems when you have the money, when you have the big scores, and you are going to be on top again when you lose. You know what I'm saying? So it's like... I, but have you experienced that b before? Like the, you know, you know, like the idea of I might not bounce back? Has that ever happened? No. No. Because, okay. I, because I've called upon my past experience. I've never, ever gotten myself in a quagmire that I haven't been able to get out of. It's never happened. Because I'm a problem solver by nature. So the more problems I put on my plate, the more creative I become. And then I create my own upward spiral off of my own fumes. I'm huffing. See, my style is I huff my own fumes. I get high off my own, off my own supply. I get high off my own visions and my own dreams because I'm a man of action. So when I have a creative idea, I implement at the snap of a finger. I don't fuck around. I don't sit on ideas. You know what I'm saying? Like, that's why I told these young guys, I was like, dude, if you're living in an apartment, you really should have barren walls. You know what I mean? Like, you should actually create a home environment where you're bored to tears. Because when you're bored and you're staring at the walls all day and you don't have huge fucking computer networks and video game consoles and all this fucking technology, it pisses you the fuck off that you're sitting at home not doing anything. It makes you so irate. Like, like, dude, here's, here's, here's the thing, right? Like, here's what, here's what would make me go into a, a battle frenzy and operate at a frenetic pace where I could literally do anything. I could literally do the impossible over and over, over again is the simple idea of not being able to go get a fucking burger. Like if you are a man and there's something that you want to do right now that you literally can't do because of a financial reason or because of other reasons, that should make you so angry that you are not free enough to drive 45 minutes to the best burger in your city and grab that fucking gourmet burger. Like, that's how petty the greats really are. And people, the average person is so accepting of the word no. And they're so accepting of, uh, well, I kind of want to gratify this whim right now, but 
it's really not that important. No, no, no. It's very important. Your life depends upon being able to advocate for yourself for the smallest, tiniest of things. And I would be in those situations where I would wake up some mornings in my 20s and I couldn't go buy a cup of coffee. And it would be something like it would be something, some existential torture of not being able to get myself a fucking cup of coffee that would set me off onto a Judeo Christian crusade where I now have to hack and slash my way to the fucking top and rise rank and get above the hierarchy just so I don't ever have to feel the pain of that again. Because I was fraught. I was distraught by the idea of just not being able to do what I wanted to do. It's that simple. Like, it's not about the coffee. It's about being a man, being a full-sized, red-blooded male with raging hormones and not being able to do what you want to do. That should make you fucking furious. You should be livid if you're at home right now and you literally are landlocked and you can't do what you want to do, can't go where you want to go, can't say what you want to say, can't talk to who you want to talk to. That should fucking make you so irate that you have no choice but to walk out of your front door and go start doing things. And that's what would happen to me. It would be the tiniest little thing that I couldn't do, or like I couldn't buy a pair of Nikes or I couldn't buy a new pair of training shoes. It would just piss me off and I would have nothing else to do with my time, but get vengeance over it. Do you understand? 100%. So for a young guy, do you have any general advice on, uh, you know, how to you know, go out there and start making money? Money, money making is a very intimate process, my brother. Like, I don't think anybody on earth can actually point a man in the correct direction to make money. I think it's, it's, a, it's as intimate as your sex life. It's a very, the way a man makes money, I think, says everything about him. Like, it's, a, it's, it's the totality of your personality. It's all of your faculties channeled together. It's, it's the fabric and essence of your being. Like, whatever you choose to spend your time earning a dollar, that is such a fucking hyper-personalized aspect of a man's life. Like, if someone came to me and said, how do I make money? I, I, I can't even answer that question. That's like asking me what kind of bitch you should be attracted to. Like, I don't know. I don't know what you like. You know what I mean? Like, your predilections are going to be very different from mine. So like, it's just not even a question or a territory that I even try to try to breach because I think the way a man chooses to make money, especially in the year 2023, um, you know, the money climate is the closest cousin to war. It's the closest cousin to warfare is getting your lion's share in life, getting your lot, putting your stamp on the world, making craters, leaving your footprint on this earth. Um, you do that through business now. You don't do that through war. And so those are very close cousins. And the reason why I say that is because the amount of pressure and stress and strain that I've been under financially my whole life, um, I'm telling you, I have a lot of the character patterns and resemblances to a motherfucker with PTSD from Vietnam. I don't give a fuck what anybody says. If you go into the bowels of business at the level that I'm talking about and you're straddling and you're redlining that line, I'm telling you, it is identical to the experiences that people have in very very gruesome situations it can be that fucking real it can manifest as being that real because you know you're you're risking your livelihood every day to be somebody to be somebody and i think that's the hugest problem with the with the fucking gen z and the motherfuckers today is no one wants to put their identity on the line to get what they want and i like there's no other way to do it <laughs> there, there's no other way to do it like you you can still preserve your integrity and your character while you're doing that but there's you have to put your identity at risk there's, there's no there's no other way bro i, I gotta get another sig go ahead you previously said um uh, um and i'm prayer phrasing no man should like fake it till he makes it am i right correct okay but but how do you reconcile that with, with like some people? They may just just be like losers, you know. <laughs> you know, like if you're trying to like strike up a business deal, say, you know, with um, you know, you know, with a businessman, right? But mm -hmm. but you're not at that tier. Uh, you know, shouldn't you like you know kind of like fake the identity of being someone who is actually worth something? You know, fuck, fuck no, because you're always going to 
listen, you're always going to revert back to your self-image. Like you, you, you cannot outperform your self-image in life. If you have a self-image and a self-identity problem and you've, if you've, you've typecasted yourself as a loser, it doesn't matter how far you tread above the water or how much success you come into. You will 100% revert back to your own, to your, to your self-image. You're always going to do that. Like you cannot outperform that. And the only way you improve your self-image is through self-talk. Do you understand? Like you have to, you have to stomp out all the interior voices in your head from a critical parent or just whatever voices are in your head. And you have to now become master and commander of yourself. And you have to talk over those voices. That's really the only way to bolster and make a very robust self image is through self talk. Gotcha. So then that's not even faking it. That's just you reconstructing. That's you, that's, that's you rewi rewiring who you are. Now, obviously, dude, I do think blood is king. I think genetics play a massive part in all of this. And I do, I do believe in fate. I think fate 100% is going to steer men in pretty much the direction that they're supposed to go in. However, when it comes to a situation where, like you said, losers, bro, most people, no matter what they do, are going to end up losers. And I think that's a liberating concept because, dude, if everybody was a CEO, hard-charging, type A personality killer, you wouldn't have a functional society. They're, they're, they're a very, very instrumental, symbiotic component of the, of the universe and the harmony of the biosphere that we live in. We need those people. And, and those people, I don't even like calling them losers because a lot of people that I think are low aspirational are, can be very utilitarian. Like you need hunters need farmers, you know what I mean? F farmers need hunters. Like we all need each other. So I don't, I don't really operate under the assumption that like, I don't, I don't, I don't really like the idea of, oh, I don't fucking hang out with losers. It's like, dude, there's, there's literally a utility and a purpose for everybody. I can find a way to incorporate anybody, no matter what station of life they're in. I know how to incorporate them into my life to make things better. You know, I'll give you an example. Let me give you an example. Okay. This will illustrate it perfectly for you. Um, okay. So people think people are under the assumption that you get status from knowing uh, high tier successful people, right? Like that's just kind of like a common thing. Like everyone would think, okay, if you know the owner of this restaurant, that must mean that you're high status. When it comes to a lot of mechanisms like that, it's actually the reverse. Okay. Let me give you an example. If I pull up to a restaurant and I'm on a date with a girl, and all the valet guys are coming up to me, shaking my hand, dapping me up, giving me hugs, being enthusiastic, ear to ear grin, happy to see me. Then I walk into the restaurant, the host, they come around shaking my hand. Great to see you. Boom. I'm being walked over to my table. Bus boys are coming out of every fucking cupboard, shaking my hand, delighted to see me. Okay. That experience, that journey. From the time I walked from my car to my table, all the unskilled low level workers who you would think are invisible and meaningless and losers, they were just an instrumental component of the story of making me seem like an extremely high status man, right? If you take that carbon copy scenario that I just outlined for you and you pit it up against the opposite scenario where a guy goes to a restaurant, valet doesn't know who the fuck he is no one gives a fuck that he's in there bus boys don't care chef don't care waiter don't care host don't care he gets escorted to his table but the owner comes out and the owner is very acquainted with him and shakes his hand that guy who just got in, who just got dapped up by the owner is lower status than the motherfucker who just got greeted by all the low unskilled workers and i'll tell you why the low unskilled invisible worker they get shit on all day Nobody gives a fuck about them. But the man who goes in and takes care of those quote unquote losers and he treats them like a human being and he treats them like royalty and he treats them as mercenaries. He tips them well. He fucking goes out of his way to shake their hand and give them appreciation for fucking taking care of his car, for parking it out front. That motherfucker is a hundred times higher status than the guy who just knows the owner and treats the lower workers like shit. That guy is a hundred times higher status. Not only is he higher status, he has an army. He has an army. He can go to the valet guy mid-dinner, mid-dinner if he so chooses, and tell that motherfucker, hey, bro, 
go to that liquor store down the street and go get me a pack of turquoise spirits. That motherfucker will jump on that fucking horse like a galloping fucking gazelle and go retrieve you a pack of cigs and bring it to you table side. The owner ain't going to do that. You have a whole army now. Now you got a battalion. And that's why I said, and I told these young motherfuckers, I said, when you're on the come up, you're making a big mistake kissing up and kissing ass to the big dogs. And, and, and the biggest mistake you're making is shitting on the low guys. The low guys, you need, when you're an up and comer, you need the little guys on your team. That's your army. That's your base. You need to treat those guys like fucking kings and make them feel special. Because those guys will literally do anything for you. I've, I've had valet numbers in my phone for years. These guys are mercenaries. They will do any. They'll go literally travel fucking three hours out of the way to go get you raw milk if they have to. They don't give a fuck. Like, that's a whole fucking life hack that motherfuckers don't take advantage of. Everyone wants to suck dick and kiss ass for the big dogs. And I have proffered this, that if you're a young up-and-comer, you should. Be, those are the guys you should be going to war with. Why are you kissing ass to a gatekeeping big dog motherfucker who wants to keep you suppressed? That's the mother. You, you have to pick, choose worthy opponents in this life. Do you understand? You got to be willing to go toe to toe with people who are stronger and better than you. Those are the people that you should be competing with. You don't kiss their ass. And the low people, bro, those are the backbones of society. So like when you say losers, I'm giving you a reframe. Those motherfuckers aren't losers. They're very important pieces of the story. God knows I have put those motherfuckers to work left and right and given them tons of blessings and accolades and put them in higher positions. I've given them side work. I've given them side jobs. Like you would think a valet guy's a fucking loser, right? And he's, he's 35 years old, but there's a, there's a, there's a play for him. You know what I mean? And real winners and real killers, they know how to make those, how to elevate those lower status people. That's my fucking point. Gotcha. So how do you identify whether you're the, the, the hunter or gatherer as to not waste time? in your position in the world, right? If, like, if you have, if you have to ask, you're a farmer. Yeah. But well, I was asking for the whole space. <laughs> yeah. I mean, if you, if you ever find yourself, it's the same thing. If you ever find yourself worrying about testosterone, you got low T, you yeah. know what I mean? Like if you, if you wonder if your testosterone is high, it's not. If you want, if you're out here wondering if your estrogen is high, it is, <laughs> it is <laughs> like, you we everybody knows who they are brother i don't i don't buy it for one second that no one knows what they're supposed to be here to do people just want a stall tactic and they want to ask you questions they know the answer to because what they're really hoping for is when they come to me for advice they want me to give them a terribly wrong answer so they can waste more time do you understand yeah they want me to throw them off course and they're praying I'm going to give them an opposite of answer of what they know to be true because they want to stall. They don't want life to start now. Yeah. So, so for the young guys, like if you are a hunter, right, and um, do you just, you know, blaze in, you know, your own path? Like, or do you take inspiration from some, you know, some guys like, I mean, sure, you're an inspiration, right? But say, like, if you're a 20-year-old guy, right? Um, Brother, let, let me interrupt you, bro. Like, I, I don't, I don't, I'm not a role model. I don't view myself as a role model in any way, shape, or form. I'm just sharing my own strength, wisdom, and hope from the things that I've experienced. Under no circumstances do I think that anybody should be living like me. You know, when I did that video the other day of talking about how the fat guy, the fat guy who leans into being the jolly fat guy, he has higher upside than the motherfucker who wants to deny who he is and go on that homogenized prescription of everyone being a fucking fitness freak, right? Okay, that guy who leans into being the jolly fat guy, that motherfucker is more like me than the motherfucker who shaves their head like a mohawk, starts smoking cigs and starts fucking firing bets. Like the motherfucker who's leaning into their own edge, that guy's exactly like me. And that's what I want for everybody that listens to me. I just want everybody to be who the fuck they're supposed to be. I don't want anybody to be like me. That's never been my shtick. My shtick is lean into your fucking edges and understand that the animal organism is brilliant. And if it's giving you maladaptive behaviors, it's doing it for a reason. And you need to lean in and you need to maximize those attributes in order to push yourself further. Because that's your propulsion mechanism. That's what I stand for. That's what I believe in. I believe in everybody should be finding their edge and leaning into it as hard as they possibly can. 
Because what's the alternative? The edge is going to go back the other way and it's going to knife you. It's going to serrate your fucking own heart if you don't use it. Do you understand? Uh, yeah, and I think you said in the past is to really find that, is to sit in silence. And that goes back to what you were just saying earlier. Was well, to- you, find, you find your edge through the things that you have to do. And this is where life actually becomes so simple. But nobody will tell you this because it's not sexy what I'm about to say. It's not sexy. It's very hard to package what I'm about to tell you in any kind of marketing angle. The, the, the reality of life is this. Someone will come to me and they'll say, hey, Brute, I want to be a multimillionaire. How do I go about this? My first thought when someone asks me that type of question is you want to be a millionaire. You don't need to be a millionaire because if you needed to be a millionaire, you would already know and you would already be doing everything you can to get there. So life is simple in the sense that as a man, there are certain things that you have to do for whatever reason. This is why, look, women are the rational, logical sex. No way. I don't give a fuck what anybody says. Women are the rational, logical sex because women are predictable. If you are a man who understands women, you actually, everything they do makes perfect sense. It makes perfect, crystal clear sense to me why women do what they do. But the undertakings, the things that men are willing to put themselves through to to approach their dreams is extremely fucking irrational and makes zero sense. Some guys absolutely have to blow torch through the world to get rich. You don't understand. It's not a want to them. They have to. They can't cope. They can't sleep. They can't eat. They can't rest. They can't fuck. They can't enjoy anything until they hit that goal. They have to do it. They need to do it. Those guys aren't on Twitter asking people questions on how to become a millionaire. Do you understand? Because they have to do it already. So you will already know from an early age the things you have to do. I have to take risk. I have to. I don't have a choice. It's the way I'm wired. I'm a natural risk taker. I don't give a fuck what anybody says. I ain't ever living in a world where I don't take risk. I have to honor who I am at my fucking core. It's who I am, brother. I have to put up shots. I have to take risk. It's what feeds the beef. It's what feeds the machine. So it's so simple. If you want to do something, I've, I, I just don't see people wanting anything to actually achieve it, brother. I've never seen it. When someone tells me they want to do something, I just roll my eyes. I'm like, good luck, man. You're on a real fucking tough road right now because you just want it. Want is so weak. It's so fleeting. There's certain things that you have to do. And you will know it's a very personal. That's why I said making money is very personal. You will know what that is. And you probably know it right now as we're speaking. Yep. You know what I mean? Like you just have to, you have to get one over on that. Maybe your heart was broken by a woman and now you have to turn yourself into a fucking monster to get over on that. Okay. So lean into that. Like that's actually, it's, it's funny. You actually get a much more functional society and you get a cohesive societal structure when everybody's actually leaning into their true nature and their true edge. Like that's actually the, the road to harmony. That's how you fix societal issues. It starts right there. It starts right there, but it's terrifying because most people's grip on sanity and safety is too tight. And that's the fucking problem. Safety and sanity has never produced a goddamn motherfucking thing for civilization. Never. It's never done it. It's actually broken it at the fucking seams and it's destroyed everything in its fucking wake. The blowback of men gripping too tightly on safety and sanity has literally been a fucking curmudgeon. It has absolutely left an avalanche of destruction in society. Oh, we can see the results right now. <laughs> That's what I'm saying, bro. And you had a fantastic yeah, tweet, man. Uh, the flip of the coin one. You, you know, you, if you're struggling between two decisions, flip, flip the coin. And that millisecond of it being in the air... You're going to know uh, exactly what you, you know, what to yeah. pick. I mean, that was, that was a hyperbolic comment because if you're really paying attention, what it means is you don't even ever have to flip the coin. You already know. <laughs> uh, yeah, you yeah. know what I mean? The coin is just sort of the illusion. It's sort of the illusion to illuminate the ridiculousness of your own, of your own self-deception. But if you're really paying attention, you yeah. would know that every man already has kind of a stalwart um, kind of zeal towards whatever it is they're supposed to pursue in this life. And if you ignore that, 
look, it, all paths are going to be painful and treacherous. So it's like, why not subject yourself to pain for a possible, by the way, I've never seen someone climb to the top of the summit of where they want to be and not get a hundred X return on what they thought was up there. Like the top of the mountain, once you actually get there is actually far greater than you even can even realize or even fucking dream of. Like it's, it's what, whatever's up there for you is way, way, way more incomprehensible than you can possibly fathom. That's mm -hmm. why it's worth taking on this type of work. You know what I'm saying? Because, dude, I'm telling you, the peak of the summit, it's fucking gorgeous up there. And then you got to find a new summit. The work is never done, my brother. The work is never done. I mean. <laughs> is, that work, is, is, is that work worth torching, say, a relationship like with your father? If it's, if it's, uh, if it's inhibiting your growth? Fuck yeah. It's the most ethical thing you could do. Think about it from this perspective. If you're, if you're supposed to be the man you're supposed to be and somebody in your life, I don't give a fuck if they're blood or not, is holding you back, you are destroying generations of people by not leaning into that. Because when you yourself do become a father, you have the responsibility of being individuated. You have the responsibility of being the complete man so that you can birth and bequeath those lessons to your kids who will then impart them to their kids. Do you understand? So you're destroying a chain link. You're literally actually fucking committing genocide against your own people when you do not take on this work. You're committing genocide against your own fucking people. Your unborn children are being punished. That's how change. serious this is. That's and how fucking can... serious this is. Yes, of course. Generational curses can 100% be broken. I'm doing it right now. I'm oh, teaching so you can change from being a... Uh, sorry to interrupt, but you could change then for hypothetically... From being a loser into a, you know, for, yeah, at least you're found. So you said it's in the blood partially, right? It is. is. The only way, yes, you can wear a mask. You can wear a persona. That's what you can do. If you're a loser and you want to LARP as a big dog, you can get away with that for a very long time. The problem is, is that mask will be unsheathed. I've never seen someone successfully pull off a persona for a long stretch and not get caught. It's never happened in world history. I also don't believe, I don't believe lies I believe every lie ever told gets gets uncovered at some point. I believe that's true. I don't. I don't. That's why I don't fucking believe in lying to women. I don't believe in lying in general because I've never seen a lie not be revealed on a long enough time scale. They all come out. So you can wear a mask if you want to. But then here's the interesting thing. Okay, if you wear the mask and you wear the persona long enough, you do kind of become that thing over time. And that's not really a fake it till you make it thing because there's a ton of action and thrust behind that. I mean, look at Tate. I've mentioned this over and over again. Tate actually became that persona. He became that guy. He manifested it. You know what I mean? Like that's the Nietzschean, that's the Nietzschean thing. The whole Nietzschean thing of will to power. It's actually taking a lie and making it true. You know what I mean? And that's what masters do. That's what the, the people who have the most talent in the world, they take a lie and they make it true before your very eyes. That's magic. That's as magical, that's an, as alchemical of a process as you're ever going to find on planet Earth is taking a lie and making it real. You know what I'm saying? And that's what marketers are trying to do now. And that's why the marketing industry is fucked because everyone's embellishing, everyone's bullshitting. And very few people have the stamina and the high energy and high intelligence to make the dream they're selling actually real. Very few people have that capability. Very few. Goggins would probably be another example, right? I don't know too much about Goggins. All I know is he fucking runs fucking an obscene amount of fucking mileage and screams at you to not be a pussy. That's all I know about Goggins. That stuff doesn't appeal to me at all. I mean, there's no nobody on earth that's able to be as hard on me as I am on myself. So the motivational porn shit, like, I can't even look at that stuff. Mm hmm you want to illuminate it for me? So what's his, what's his fucking spiel? Um, uh, Work the, hard. The, don't be a pussy. Don't be a fag. Exactly. Yeah, 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 yeah. I mean. I, boy, he has done some insane, like, things that, you know, like. I mean, yeah, I, I guess his credits is the fact that he's done insane shit that the average man can't do. Yeah, I mean, I respect it. He's a guy who's also tried to push human limits, obviously, and kind of test, like, the end ranges and, and living on the edge. I mean, I definitely can jive with that for sure. But, but I guess the only point of uh, 
uh, conjecture is that he's advertising that to like every like anybody could do that. Exactly, my brother. Exactly, and that's what I'm here. Tack- that's what I'm here tackling today. You know, yep. like like if you if you paid attention, I inserted some very sneaky jabs at stoicism throughout this because look. Stoicism has tricked a lot of men into thinking that accepting a life that you despise, accepting, keyword accepting, a life that you despise has masculine virtue behind it because you're sucking it up. You're grin and bearing it. You're stomaching it. You're not telling anybody that, that, you, that you hate your life. You're putting on a fucking face and pretending you're okay with it. That's what stoicism eventually leads people to do is it leads you to pretend that you are okay with circumstances that in your spirit you're not really okay with. And that is not masculine at all. Coming home to a wife that you despise, coming home from a job that you hate, there is no masculine virtue in that whatsoever. And sucking it up and pretending that you're happy in a situation that you're not is the most appalling I, I, I literally words cannot articulate how disgraceful that type of lifestyle is. It's it's the most cowardly living life on your knees thing you could possibly do. It takes a hundred times more heart and balls to walk away from that and go build the life that you want for yourself so that you're no longer a fucking charlatan pretender sucking everything up, pretending like everything's okay. I'm just going to let everything fucking roll off my shoulders. It's, it's fucking absurd. I tweeted the other day, there's a Russian word called terpila. It means a tolerator. It's a derogatory word in Russian. It means someone who's a pushover, someone who just accepts, someone who just takes, someone who just receives, someone who just absorbs. And that's ultimately what the modern perturbation of stoicism leads men to do. It leads you to be a bulletproof vest rather than a fucking hand cannon. You're a bulletproof vest. You're absorbing bullets and pretending that it's okay. And then you just become a tolerator. And everyone's fucking walking all over you your entire fucking life. And you, and you think it's masculine because you're, you're suffering in silence and nobody knows. But, but really, you're the butt of everybody's joke. <laughs> you, become, you become the butt of, of the American joke when you live that way. That's being propagated as masculinity. That's insane that... Well, of course it's propagated as masculinity because masculinity in its fundamental essence is sucking things up and being okay with pain and not showing it, right? But the problem is people have deceived themselves into thinking that means that it's cool to accept a life that you hate. And that was never never the point. That was never the point. You suck it up to the life that you want. (laughs) That's courage. That's valor. That's honor. That's living a gallant life. You know what I mean? That's the most honorable, noble thing a motherfucker could do. That's what, I'm, that's what I'm telling you. So there's a whole, and a lot of men in this fucking space, I know they're fucking cringing right now because they see it in themselves. They know that they're living a life they hate and they're trying to pretend that it's masculine to just shrug it off like it ain't, like it ain't no thing. And I'm here to tell you it is a fucking thing. And it's a huge fucking problem. Another life saved, bro. Another fucking life saved. I'm going to close it right there. This was phenomenal.